Good evening, everybody. Sorry. This is the second function we are having tonight, uh, today, and I'd like to welcome uh, the new arrivals, and I'd like to thank the others for persevering a few more hours with us. And uh, apart from welcoming you to the University of the Sato Center, uh, I will say nothing else. I'd ask uh, Peter Rosales to chair the meeting and introduce us. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I really would like to welcome all of you to our event uh, here at the University today. Thank you for making time to be with us. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome especially our guest from Cyprus, uh, Harris uh, Babakaralambus, uh, who is the Director General of the Cyprus Investment Promotion Agency who has made this special trip to be here with us uh, tonight. And I really appreciate that, Harris. Thank you very much for being here with us. My special thanks to Professor Karalambus, uh, the patron of the center, and to Alicia Chrysostom, the director of the center, for providing the facilities to enable us to have the event uh, here in uh, this uh, lovely boardroom. Harris is eminently well qualified as well as expertly informed to apprise us of the latest developments uh, on the island. And even more importantly, I think he's very well placed to inform us about the newly formulated strategic investment priorities uh, in Cyprus in the light of the recent uh, crisis there. I have no doubt that his insights will be invaluable. I would like to acknowledge the presence here tonight of a good number of uh, people who are experts and indeed authorities in their fields and I have no doubt that they will make a contribution to the discussion that we want to encourage um, at the end of the speeches. As president of the Federation and of Ebisfimi, I want to emphasize that I see this event as an essential part of a strategy and an evolving plan designed to enhance the image of Cyprus in this country and in Europe, and of course to promote Cyprus as a center for investment in vital sectors of the economy, primarily tourism, services in the broadest sense of that word, education and culture, and of course energy. Although Cyprus is no longer in the eye of a media storm and has now slipped from the front pages of most of the international newspapers, it is important to take stock as to what happened. The anger, dismay and disquiet felt by our community in this country and indeed by Cypriots everywhere at the unfairly selective treatment meted out to Cyprus by the Eurozone authorities and the IMF has certainly not dissipated. There are big questions as to why the Eurozone authorities acted in the way that they did in relation to Cyprus. And those questions remain essentially unanswered. What is clear is that eminently workable solutions, such as the recapitalization of the two main Cypriot banks and their effective nationalization by the European Central Bank, were not given the time of day. Such measured solutions, which could have been further calibrated by a more managed contraction of the banking sector, over a transitional period were set aside with the result that Cyprus's economy has now suffered a devastating blow. Nor was Cyprus a special case within the Eurozone, as some have argued. Yes, Cyprus's banking sector was large relative to the size of the rest of its economy. But there are examples within the Eurozone where the banking sector is even more dominant. Malta and Ireland are a case in point. But Luxembourg, 
takes the prize. In its case, its banking assets at the end of 2011 stood at in excess of 2,500% of its GDP, about three times, three and a half times larger than Cyprus's at that time. Generally, sorry, generalized and unsubstantiated accusations that Cyprus was a money laundering paradise have similarly been found to be a red herring. And if you examine the report that Moneyball has produced, you will find that they haven't identified any specific instances of money laundering. Now, they have identified some cases where that there is inefficiency in the system, but they have said that that is something that is generally the case in many other jurisdictions, including many within the Eurozone. Of course, the aftermath of this crisis in Cyprus is unsustainably high unemployment. I think it's now at 15%, isn't it? Oh. And rising. Lack of prospects for young people, including a considerable number of graduates, and the absence of inward investment. In the face of this crisis, diaspora Cypriots, including high profile British business people, have pledged to act as Cyprus's ambassadors abroad <coughs> in a bid to attract investment from Britain and Europe in the key sectors of the economy that I mentioned earlier. <coughs> we are actively working with a number of uh, such people in relation to specific initiatives that we want to pursue. And the idea will be to engage with Harris, with the ministers in Cyprus, and with other agencies on the island in order to advance these initiatives. These will be announced in due course. Now, during a visit to Cyprus last month, I had the pleasure of meeting President Anastasiadis and other key figures on the island. I was encouraged by the caliber and degree of engagement from all of the people we met, including the President, Archbishop Chrysostomos, and of course, Harris, as well as others. I was also struck by the dignity with which the Cypriot people have handled the crisis. Although there's no question that hard times you know, lie ahead, I have no doubt that their spirit of enterprise, their ingenuity, and their resilience will enable the island to recover and prosper once again. My message today is that the island's authorities have to remain vigilant and must be ready to examine all options which may enable Cyprus to extricate itself from the constraints and austerity measures of the bailout program, which carry the risk of pushing the island's economy into a prolonged state of depression. My message also is that immediate focus and priority must be directed at the development and exploitation of the island's energy resources, including the construction of an LNG plant, which would attract huge investment and would be a source of long-term unemployment for thousands of people, both during the construction phase and subsequently. Cyprus's gas reserves provide cause for optimism, but we must be under no illusion that their profitable exploitation and their potential use to regenerate the Cyprus economy will require absolute strategic clarity, the ability to navigate a myriad of internal as well as external issues, including the geopolitics of the region, and above all, it will require a clear roadmap underpinned by ruthless focus on implementation. I'm slightly disappointed that that isn't happening at the moment in the way that it should. Now, the friendship and solidarity of our friends in this country and of everyone in this room is appreciated and will be critical ingredients of the strategies that we develop 
and employ in seeking to regenerate the island. I therefore urge all of you to remain engaged in this process and to support our events and activities in the future. Thank you very much for being here with us. I look forward to having a discussion with you afterwards. I would now like to invite uh, Harris for his own contribution. First of all, uh, let me thank Peter very much for the wonderful words said about me, um, but also for the excellent speech, I think, spot on. I'd also like to thank John and uh, the University for assisting in making this first step, as it was also mentioned, uh, viable, and we certainly see this as a very first step in a lot that needs to be taken for the community here to be able to assist as they wish to do the Cypriot economy. Now, I have a small presentation. <coughs> Okay, the sun is helping as well. Can you see? It's, it's not going to come back. <laughs> I'll try and make it brief. The intention is to allow us an ample of time for discussion. I think that's probably much more beneficial than having me talk and um, a lot of things you may know or have heard before. In any case, um, just a very brief note that a lot of what's going to be said here are actually my own personal views and positions and I'm only making a note of this because among other I was asked to say a few words on how we actually got here and that could be a little bit tricky and because I'm not known for holding back of my thoughts <laughs> um, I thought I'd just put that in. Two words on SIBA, the Cyprus Investment Promotion Agency, we are actually a non-for-profit organization. It's a private company, owned, however, by the government. So we are sort of um, a private entity, but owned by the government. Established in 2007, but we actually oper started operations in 2008. SIBA's role, as the name suggests, is to uh, promote Cyprus overseas, to provide investor facilities, and to improve the regulatory uh, framework uh, that has to do mostly with foreign investors. That, of course, influences all type of investments. And um, SIBA actually was ranked fifth last year in a survey done by uh, the Global Investment Promotion Best Practices Report uh, in 2012. <coughs> Doing business in Cyprus, well, we are here as your first point of contact, we are here as your independent guidance, and we are here to address and resolve, hopefully, every single issue that you have and encourage and facilitate additional investments thereafter. Global competition, I just put here very, very quickly uh, some uh, key uh, rankings, but the question mark is these are all good and nice and they look good. 20,184, 24,134 countries, but all this is unfortunately these days a little bit irrelevant, I mean, say. How do we get here? And why are all those statistics uh, slightly relevant? Well, having lived through the whole situation, uh, I think I can say that the answer is quite simple and uh, probably quite straightforward. We got too many things wrong and not enough things right, and we probably got the big things wrong and uh, not so many of the big decisions right. Here it is, a series of miscalculations, mistakes, lack of clear vision, bad practices, narrow-mindedness, a long-standing cultural issues, and political pressures. Now, this is put mildly compared to some of the comments we had earlier today, so I guess I'm not that uh, critical after all, but however, I think this sums it up, and this has, of course, to do uh, not only, I would say, the past four or five years, but it, it goes a bit further back in essence. This is, these are general things that characterize uh, the secret economy, unfortunately, for, for a number of years. More specifically, however, let's see uh, five or six key issues that uh, impacted uh, 
and brought us here today. First of all, it was the exposure of the two main banks actually to Greek bonds. That was, on, I put it in into numbers, approximately four and a half billion euros. That's more or less almost 25% of the country's GDP. Actually, it's more than 25. Um, the risk assessment and international expansion of um, at least the two big banks, and when I'm talking about risk, I mean loans and how they were given, uh, to whom and at what size, and all these things, and how we expanded uh, our banks to make them grow to reach seven times the GDP. Again, we hindsight, we see that a lot of things were done, uh, and facts prove that lots of decisions there were slightly wrong, to say the least. Um, the, the third factor was the fact that we actually uh, inherited Marfin at the end of the day as a Cypriot bank when it could have stayed as a branch. This was, if I'm not mistaken, sometime in March 2011. We still could have stopped it. That would have accounted for another three and a half billion, more or less, in uh, loans uh, that are not served uh, in, in Greece. And they were part of the deal. Of the Greek, uh, of the Greek part of the two banks that went finally uh, to a Greek bank. Delayed and insufficient measures to control public spending and public debt. We all know about that. Uh, this has been going on for many, many years. I believe that uh, something like 15 or even more years ago, we had some actuaries review the provident fund, uh, the retirement fund of the public sector. They came up and said. By 2020, it won't be viable. Then the next government, 10 years ago, asked another set of actuaries to do the same survey. The same answer came back. The last government did the same thing. Uh, no decisions have been taken. Um, well, now finally something has been put in place. Um, wrong assessment on a number of situations. Clearly, evidently, we didn't get it right. We didn't assess our friends correctly. We didn't assess the circumstances correctly. And over-dependence on specific sectors, that's another issue like banking, uh, maybe, and unwillingness to reform and solve the major issues for many years. I've already touched upon this. Cyprus services are not fortunately another example. Over and over again, plans for restructuring and uh, a new uh, business plan for Cyprus Airways have been discussed, I think, at least four times up to now over the last year. This would be the fifth, I think. Now, um, <coughs> have we been treated fairly? Well, the answer again is very, very simple. It's no, no, no. To quote the late Margaret Thatcher on a similar issue uh, regarding the euro, it is very clearly. We haven't been treated uh, fairly, but then again, um, you know, this is. A fact of life. Uh, competition is there, everybody looks at their own uh, priorities and we have to learn to play the game. And the no's go in economic terms, in political terms, as well as in ethical terms at the end of the day. And it's very clear to me that an orchestrated plan was on the table. It was a Friday, it was a long weekend, it was the first days of the new government. Uh, let's put them in the corner and let's solve this the way we want it. Um, this, as I said, is my personal opinion, but I'm sure it's shared by a lot, a lot of people, at least in Cyprus, and I think not only in Cyprus. However, this is not an excuse. Fact remains, we should have been in a position to foresee these things. We were told that there will be a haircut at the deposits, and it was in every single big international media for a couple of weeks at least. We just didn't want to listen. That includes myself, by the way. I have to say that on Friday, on Friday 15th of March, I was sitting with some friends discussing in the evening, and they mentioned something that said, forget it, it's never going to happen. It is a stupid idea. <coughs> it's just talk. So I didn't want to listen either. So where do we stand today? Well, things are starting to improve. Not by much, but certainly we are seeing things being put into place. Things are slowly, slowly, maybe slower than I would personally like, but at least they are happening and they are coming into play. 
although there are still issues that need to be resolved. Let's very briefly go through them. An MOU is in position. The first two billion have been released. The IMF, by the way, I heard uh, this morning, has also approved for their one billion contribution. So that's another milestone covered. Money valuing the external experts, I will not mention their name, have concluded their money laundering review. I am in a position to verify uh, what uh, Peter has already mentioned, that yes, there are some weaknesses identified, but specific cases have not been found. A little bit like Iraq <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the nuclear weapons, never found. Um, the two problematic banks are being managed. Uh, the Bank of Cyprus, which is nowadays the only one that exists, has absorbed the operations of Lighty Bank, even if you, uh, the communication they have now, uh, if you were with Lighty, comes as Bank of Cyprus, in brackets, ex Lighty. That's what my SMS said when I used the Lighty credit card yesterday. Uh, and um, there is a board in place. There seems to be a consensus between the central government and the, uh, the central bank and the government on the type of CEO that the bank needs. So that's another piece of good news that the central bank and the government are aligned and have realized that they need to work together. Capital movement restrictions are being uh, removed slowly, slowly. We had the 11th uh, decree earlier this week. It didn't have many changes, but we expect another one this week that will release even more uh, of, these, uh, of the restrictions. And as far as I know, four banks have actually been given the green light if they want to, to release the restrictions completely. So things, again, are moving forward. Suddenly, we are seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Almost all foreign companies seem to be staying in Cyprus. We've had very few that actually uh, decided that they will leave. I don't know of anyone that has actually left already. And this is another piece of good news because it's evident that a lot of the things that brought them there to start with are still in place. So a lot of the advantages that Cyprus offers are still there. And I think the last point that I have here is that the legal and structural changes are being implemented. And this is also very important for any type of investors. A lot of things need to change. The public sector needs to upgrade itself. We need to become much friendlier, quicker, and uh, less uh, bureaucratic. Uh, there's one more. Opportunities are opening up. That's an important uh, piece of uh, uh, information, and I'll come to that uh, in the next slides. So, as I said already, Cyprus maintains its uh, competitive advantages, strategic ge geographic location, well-developed socio-economic infrastructure. I don't want to go through all of them. I think most of them you know. I um, will just um, make a small note on the tax system. Um, as you know, the corporation tax has increased from 10 to 12.5% in Cyprus. And this may be, if you had put it on the table six months ago, people would have gone wild. Um, through this, that the percentage is important. However, the whole tax system, as it is set up with the uh, double tax treaties and everything else, is much more important as it was proved uh, with this uh, change that we've had. All the rest of the uh, issues, uh, I think you can see yourself. The last point, hydrocarbon reserves, as already mentioned, again by Peter, a very, very, very important factor altogether. And now, going into specific opportunities, um, just a little bit of a few facts on tourism and uh, a few advantages that Cyprus offers uh, for tourism, which you very well know, uh, I assume, uh, so let's stick with the opportunities. There are certainly opportunities in hotels, in leisure parks, there are discussions for a number of leisure parks going on, marinas, we already have the Limassol Marina which is well underway, so a lot of it has already been uh, concluded. Uh, we have another marina that should start anytime soon, hopefully in the in Ayanapa area. The Pavos uh, one is a little bit behind, uh, and Larnaca is a whole big project that is um, expected to start maybe in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. 
Um, then medical and health tourism. I can tell you that there's a lot of interest in this sector by a number of foreign uh, investors. They see Cyprus as a very interesting place and have, see great potential in, in this specific sector. Uh, rehabilitation centers could well go into that part and sports tourism is another sector that could attract significant um, uh, business to Cyprus if the infrastructure is put in place. At the moment what lacks in both medical health as well as rehabilitation sports tourism is mostly the infrastructure that is required, the extremely high professional level uh, of support that needs to be there and everything that goes with it. However, some projects are already in place and they are looking to expand and they have, they seem to be leading some of these sectors into significant GDP contributors in the near future. Energy, I'm not an energy expert, I have to tell you this, but certainly uh, other than the hydrocarbons, we obviously have a lot of potential in renewable energy. Um, hydrocarbons, I won't get in, and let's just say a few investment opportunities. The legislation on uh, energy distribution <coughs> is actually changing as we speak. Hopefully by the end of May or beginning of June, uh, the legislation in Cyprus will have harmonized with the European Directive and people will be able to buy um, energy at their houses from two different sources, which at the moment is not the case. Once this is done, um, a lot of investments that are planned or, and are ready and mature to go forward will probably be, uh, will start, uh, will proceed with the investment because this will give them the opportunity to sell directly to the users rather than sell to the uh, electricity authority, which the case is now for them then to distribute it to people. Renewable energy, as already mentioned, uh, I think this is uh, clearly uh, just an outline of what I've already mentioned. There is a very strong commitment, I have to tell you, from the government on renewable <coughs> energy and cheaper energy. One of the changes already introduced by the government is that uh, factories and um, businesses are now allowed under specific criteria, but it's quite uh, relaxed, uh, to <coughs> utilize their own solar energy or other producing energy to utilize directly within their uh, premises as they produce it. So they don't have to sell it back into the grid, they can use it, which is, makes much more sense because it's saving them more than what they could sell it for. Shipping. Shipping is a sector that has actually stayed untouched by this whole situation. Thank, thank to a very progressive tonnage tax system that has actually been approved by the European Union in 2010. This actually is also the big tool of shipping, of the Cyprus shipping industry. It, it allows it to, to differentiate itself as it is the one and only EU approved tonnage tax system that touches upon every three pillars of shipping, including ownership and management and chartering. Um, just a few numbers on shipping. Uh, most of you may know this. We have this morning discussed a lot on shipping for those who are here, for those who are not here. Cyprus is actually the third top maritime nation in the EU, and I think it is the second ship management center, the second largest ship management center globally. Other projects that are available, certainly in the real estate, Marinas has already discussed, thematic parks, luxurious resorts and golf courses, there are three under construction at the moment and another two that are looking for investors, educational and health projects, casinos, um, I put that in capital letters, not for any other reasons, that it's more imminent maybe, we expect within the next few months uh, for the government probably to come out with a tendering process for at least one uh, casino, which it looks like it's going to be in a concept of a multifunctional uh, uh, facility, not just a casino with a lot of other uh, 
services uh, added to it. Um, and of course, um, just to say that as of last year, we have introduced a fast track mechanism for strategic projects to give um, uh, these large projects a priority. Summarizing the opportunities, the crisis has also advantages. And one of the advantages, which is not very good for us Cypriots working and living in Cyprus, however, it's a fact. The operating cost has come down, salaries have come down significantly. Uh, thankfully, other things have also become uh, cheaper, like electricity. So competitiveness, which is a, such an important factor, uh, is actually increasing significantly. Secondly, um, the public sector is becoming much uh, quicker and uh, uh, fast-forwarding uh, different projects, as well as introducing public and public-private partnerships. This is another uh, line where the government seems to be looking uh, for assistance to uh, uh, make big projects actually materialize uh, in a time where uh, cash is scarce. Key sectors that are being developed, and I have to say here that uh, the Cyprus Investment Promotion Agency as of November 2012 actually sat down and started looking at the economy of Cyprus and what sectors we should be looking at to develop into the future. So we would disengage ourselves a little bit from the standard financial services, banking and tourism. And um, uh, these came up and sectorial studies are being done as we speak on this. They have been delayed a little bit, I have to admit, because of everything that's happened. However, education, health, uh, leisure in general, ICT, R&D are the five first ones that were indicated. Banking has been put there after everything that's happened, as we see that banking, with everything that's going on, gaps will be created and this will develop opportunities for other banks. And I can tell you for a fact that at least Three, four actually, as of today, foreign banks are uh, visiting Cyprus over the next couple of weeks to review the situation and see if uh, there is potential for them to enter. And special incentives to be given for uh, greenfield investment as well as other investments and hydrocarbon <coughs> reserves, as already mentioned, utilization expected to result in a generally quick recovery of the economy. There is, of course, a question mark. Some people will say we are well aware of that, but um, I'm sure that with the consensus and the push from all of us, uh, this uh, great industry will be developed sooner rather than later. Ultimately, <coughs> an attractive environment for investments is being developed and uh, put some smileys all around <laughs> to take away all the gloom uh, that could have been created by my initial comments. Thank you very much.